All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining our April meeting of the Astrobiology Science Communication Guild. Today, we have a great presentation. Actually, it's not a presentation. It's a 90-minute workshop from the NIFTY, NASA Inspires Futures for Tomorrow's Youth NIFTY Science Activation Team. But before we get started with our workshop, I wanted to do a quick announcement, and I'm going to share my screen for that. Um, oh, is that okay if I... Oh, it's going to undo your... Sorry. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to plug a quick um, opportunity. It's a workshop from the Planetary Reach Science Activation Team. I hope you all can see my um, my screenshot here, my screen share here. Um, Planetary Reach is a group that that provides resources and opportunities for scientists engaging Black and Latinx audiences in planetary science. And they have an opportunity coming up. It is the Culturally Inclusive Planetary Engagement Workshop. They do these periodically throughout the year. The next one coming up is May 16th through 18th, and it is in San Antonio, Texas. And what this is, is a three-day workshop, including a an actual outreach and engagement opportunity on the last day um, to learn strategies for inclusive planetary sciences engagement with diverse audiences. And so um, this one's in San Antonio. Um, they do have stipends available for those who qualify. The application deadline is May 2nd. I've heard really great feedback from this um, for, from this uh, uh, opportunity, and I encourage you all to apply. And I'm, I'm admitting folks. All right, cool. And so um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me or the contact is Andy Shaner and his contact information is right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to post this um, in the chat so everybody has that. Um, I'm going to stop the share so I can see my chat. This is the website, and I have sent this out through um, Guild emails before, but in case you all are not aware, please uh, check out that opportunity. Thanks so much to those of you who joined us um, a little bit late. I was just um, plugging a really cool opportunity from the Science Activation team called Planetary Reach, uh, the Culturally Inclusive Planetary Engagement workshops. So uh, check out the link I posted in the chat if um, you did not get to hear the intro. Okay, that's all I've got. I am going to now uh, give it away to our speakers from Nifty. Um, Katie and Nikki, feel free to please introduce yourselves, give our group a, a little intro on who you are and um, how and why you do what you do for sure. the Nifty group. So thank you so much for being here and take it away. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, Nikki and I are really excited to be here. We'll, we'll introduce ourselves in just a second and I'll say what NIFTY is and um, what our role in science activation is. So, um, but first let's start with a quick icebreaker. And so um, during our time together today, you're going to have lots of opportunities where we would like you to participate. And so we will ask you to share in the chat and there'll be times where you can unmute and talk to. So right now in the chat, think about um, who was your STEM role model or who is your STEM role model? And, and what are things that that person did to inspire your career in STEM? So take a minute, think about how you were inspired. Um, I'll let you think and, and put stuff in the chat and then Nikki and I will introduce ourselves, but I'll pause for a second first. All right, so a couple people um, have shared stuff in there and I shared about my mom. Um, and how she used to wake me and my brothers up in the middle of the night and pull out the telescope. And um, we still use that telescope. It's a telescope I used to watch the eclipse just last week. So um, that's kind of my fun, like kid moment. So we're here today to talk about role models, which is why we we asked you about that in the icebreaker. So um, keep putting stuff in there if you if you are inspired about who your role model was and things they they might have done. So um, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Katie Hassan. I use she her pronouns. Um, I work for a TV station, Twin Cities PBS. Um, we are located in Minnesota. And my job here is um, uh, I'm a senior STEM content specialist, and I'm also a producer, a science producer and an executive producer um, for some shows that we make. Um, uh, kind of the, the key show that we've made over the last, gosh, 15 years is Sci Girls. And um, Sci Girls, you'll hear us kind of mentioning Sci Girls. You'll see the logo um, on on the screen. And that was a, a PBS show. There's seven seasons of it. It's kind of aimed at like upper elementary, middle school kids, but our 
our main theme there is getting girls more interested in STEM and STEM careers. And so that's kind of where uh, we could talk for hours about Sci Girls, but I, I won't bore you with that. But um, that's where Nikki and I come from. I'll let Nikki introduce herself. Oh, gosh. <laughs> where are you? Oh, I need it. Okay, go ahead. All right. Sorry, excuse me, Katie and I were in the same room, but we're on two different computers. So we're managing the audio as we go here. Um, so my name is Nikki Beverly, uh, she, hers. I'm also at Twin Cities PBS um, and have been working with um, the education department here and the show Sci Girls um, for over 12 years now. I'm the senior STEM media and, and, and engagement specialist. So I um, have been working with uh, educators and by educators, um, across the board, both formal and informal librarians, parents, um, families that uh, to bring our gender equity teaching strategies to their programs for youth. And then I also manage all of our like online resources. So our education and websites, most, mostly the SciGirl side of things um, and other digital assets that we have. <laughs> all right, come on. All right. Okay. Sorry, we'll pause every time we switch talking just to make sure we get the muting down. Um, so you're going to hear a lot more about me and my career path later on because I'm going to give kind of an example introduction. Um, so I won't really say anything more about um, my work right now. But so let's just kind of jump in um, to what we're going to do today. And why are we here? So um, this is our NIFTY again, um, NIFTY stands for um, NASA Inspires Futures for Tomorrow's Youth. We're funded by Science Activation. Um, so this is our kind of core role model training. And we're going to go through our strategies guide, which I hope you guys all have a copy of. If not, Nikki will share later how where you can get a PDF copy of that. But it is um, widely available on our NASA website. Um, so we're going to go over those strategies with time to kind of talk about them and work through them and for you to think up examples and then Nikki's going to share some tips for working with youth. And then I um, and for doing virtual visits. So if you are um, acting as a role model um, like this through the Zoom, like talking to a group of kids, what are some tips for how you can do that? And then I'm going to give an example virtual introduction of myself. And then we'll kind of all um, evaluate that and, and talk about um, what I did and didn't do. Questions about that? Don't want to spend too much time talking about this stuff. So, okay, so what is NIFTY? Um, NIFTY is a project that is funded by NASA Science Activation. It's been going on for about two years. It's just about over. We are in a no cost extension right now. So our project actually really um, wraps up at the end of the month. But what we have been doing is pairing outreach programs. So youth group programs with people that work at NASA or are funded by NASA as a chance for the kids in these outreach programs to learn about NASA careers. Um, and so the kind of big underlying thing that this project has funded is a new updated guide about how to be a good role model. So we're really looking at um, educational research and what the research says um, we all should do when we're acting as a role model for youth, um, in particular ways to reach um, people that are underrepresented in STEM careers. So that's girls, um, the whole kind of inclusive, non-binary, trans youth, um, not gender non-conforming. We're looking at um, youth of color and um, anyone really that you could think of that might be under representatives in STEM careers. These, these strategies are really, um, research says that this is great ways to reach all youth, um, especially those who maybe haven't been reached in the past. Questions about that? Okay. So I think we should start before I dig into what the strategies are, we should start by talking about some of the vocabulary that we're using. So I'm saying role model, but a lot of you might be more familiar with the term mentor. So let's let's talk about this. So role model is generally someone who is having a shorter interaction. And the the person, the um, like the youth, maybe doesn't even have to actually know 
who the role model, like they might not have to know them on a personal level. So like someone said, um, Jane Goodall, right? Someone said that in the chat, that Jane Goodall was their role model. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be a person. I mean, maybe you did study under Jane Goodall. I don't know. But um, your role model doesn't have to be a person that you work with one-on-one -on -one all the time, but you can still really be influenced by a person like this, like a role model. And then contrasting that is a mentor. And this is a longer interaction, you know, like maybe your graduate school advisor or or um, a, a long-term youth group leader or something like that. And the reason that we're kind of making this distinction is that we really want to point out that you can have a lasting impact on someone's, um, their own personal STEM identity or, or how they think about what they could have as a career or where their, their path could lead them. You can influence that even in short-term interactions. And so what we're going to talk about today is like really digging into really effective things you can do even in a short-term interaction to really connect with youth in particular um, to, to be a good role model. Um, does that make sense? The difference between role model and mentor? Both are very important, um, but I think it's just good to kind of talk about the words we're using. Okay, so I'm going to dig into the guide um, and I will just, Nikki, we have this whole paper guide. Um, there's a, a PDF version of it that I think Svetlana shared with all of you. So what I'm going to do is um, kind of go through all of the steps in the guide and, and um, kind of break them down one by one. And again, this is all research research based strategies um, for ways that you can really connect with youth and be an effective role model. So we're really focused on youth interaction, but the these strategies are also really important for the general public. Like even if you're just talking to you know all adults at some sort of um, you know science museum gathering or public talk or something, these are all still really important for that. So strategy number one is about making a personal connection to create an inclusive inclusive learning space. And so um, this can be a lot of different things um, where you're making some sort of positive space where people um, feel like they can be their full self, where they feel included. And so ways that you can do that are like starting with an icebreaker, right? Giving a chance for people to share, um, whether it's just a small quiet sharing or kind of a big everyone, you know, round rob and everyone gets a chance to talk. Um, icebreakers can be a really great way to do that. But anything where you can start by making some sort of a connection to the people that you're talking to. And that's also um, thinking about ways that you can relate your discussion um, to them. And thinking about who are the people that I'm talking to, take some time ahead of time to learn who you're talking to um, and see like, oh, where do they all live in Texas? Oh, I used to live in Texas. I'm going to talk about Texas or they're all from um, a robotics team and I used to coach a robotics team. And so I'm going to make that connection I'm um, because I know that that's a way that I can make a connection, even if I'm just visiting with them virtually. So making a personal connection in any way that you can is a really great way um, to connect with youth or or the public in general. Um, but we we also want you to be really mindful about how you make a personal connection and don't force it um, and try not to make too many assumptions. So um, for example, when you're doing an icebreaker, we want to make sure that your icebreakers are really equitable and don't put people on the spot about something they're uncomfortable talking about. So, you know, ours was that we did at the start here was very general, like, tell us about something your role model did. Um, I didn't make everybody share. Um, for youth, it's a good example. Like, you wouldn't want to call them out and say, I want everybody to share what their parents do for work. Now, that might be really interesting to you because that helps you see um, something about the kids there, but that's not really a very equitable thing because it might make someone uncomfortable. You don't want to force them to share something that's too personal um, or that could set up some sort of like weird hierarchy in the group where it's like, oh, so and so's mom is an engineer, you know, my mom is a stay at home mom, or um, I don't have a mom or, you know, things like this. You just want to be really careful that you're not excluding anyone as you're trying to create this space that you're working in. Does that make sense? That's a lot. 
Um, the, the last sentence in here is about um, giving youth the ability to explore their the intersection in their identities. So intersectionality, I think I have a slide, I do. So intersectionality is this idea that we don't all fall into one group or category and we can be many things at once, right? Like I am a mom and a woman and a scientist and, and an educator. I can be all of those things. I don't have to just pick one and that our identities overlap in a lot of different ways. So it's um, important to think about intersectionality and that everybody is kind of always wearing many hats, um, whatever, wherever they go in the world. That's a lot. I'll pause. Okay. So um, I'm going to jump into the next one, and then I think um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about ways we can share these things. So strategy number two is about sharing your whole self and thinking about when you go to talk to a youth group, even if your goal or the educator that is, you know, maybe it's a, a, a seventh grade teacher is asking you to come talk to my class about your job um, as an astrobiologist. What we really want to push you to do is share more about yourself than just your career. You are a person. You are more than just a job. And it is very important for um, people to see that. And that's when they will make connections. So sharing more about yourself, whatever you're comfortable sharing, um, is a really great way to connect and for youth in particular to see like, oh, I could be an astronomer, but I can also be a mom and I can also love to travel and I can also be an artist. Like I don't have to just pick one thing. And, um, you know, one of the best ways for them to see that they can do all of these things is to see other people share about how they do a lot of different things. Right. So, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing, you know, talk about, um, your family, talk about, um, what I'm, I'm losing, losing my examples here. So share personal stories um, about maybe how you got into your career path. Although that's, that's another one we're going to talk about in a second, but don't be afraid to share personal stories and to share pictures. Um, I'm going to give an example introduction in just a minute. You'll see, I share lots of pictures and you know what kids in particular really, 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 really love to see pictures of your pets. If you have pets, that's what they want to see. Right. And it's going to be a thing that they ask you, right. If you put up a picture of your dog or, um, you know, your hamster or your goldfish or whatever, they're all going to be like really into it and be like, oh my gosh, what is your, what is your fish's name? Where did you get your fish? How long have you had your fish? It's going to be a really great way um, to connect with an audience. So show photos, show photos of your family, your pets, maybe just you doing something, you know, out on a hike or, um, you know, playing an instrument or something that is um, outside of just you as a job, right? You um, and what you do for your career. And um, another big piece of sharing your whole self is giving room for uh, for everyone to share their pronouns or for you to share your pronouns, um, but never expect somebody else to do that, right? We all use pronouns. Um, Nikki and I, I think in our first slide, we had our, we usually just have our pronouns on the slide. So I usually introduce myself. I'm Katie, I use she, her pronouns. And that gives the opportunity for anyone else um, to just know that I'm thinking about pronouns. And if they want to share that they use different pronouns, they can. I wouldn't ever ask, like have people go around the room and say, hey, share your pronouns so I know. But but it kind of sends this message that um, I am respectful of everybody's pronouns. Um, and is that's just a way to be respectful of who people are and kind of um, open to however they, they want to identify themselves. Um, so that's just kind of part of sharing your whole self, trying to not talk too fast here. So again, the the point here of sharing your whole self is we really want the audience or whoever whoever you're talking to to see that you're more than just a career. I'm a person who has a career. Let me talk about who I am as a person. Okay. Oh, use of pronouns. Here's my example. So um, pronouns. So this is just another way to to create an inclusive environment where everybody feels comfortable. They all feel like they're welcome. You should never call out other people and um, tell them to to use their or you know what are what's your pronouns what your pronouns what's your pronouns but just sharing starting by a conversation by sharing your own pronouns kind of opens that up um, where everybody else feels included. Okay, 
All right. So now is a chance for reflection. Um, and you can type in the chat or you can unmute if you want. I see there's a ton of stuff in the chat. I'll look at it in a second. But what do you do when you're not at work? So I want you to think about if you're talking to a youth group, what is something about you that you share um, or that you would that you would be willing to share to a youth group that you think might be interesting or might be a way to make a personal connection? What's something you like to do? Can any of us just talk or? Yep, go ahead. <laughs> um, so something I actually was just doing right now, we just brought them home today. I keep honeybees. And so I just put my beehives in today. I love that so much. Okay, so someone says they um, do salsa dancing. I like hiking, checking out cool geology. Yes. Um, playing with reptiles, hiking, seeing live music, Star Wars movies, basketball. Yeah. Reading, spending time with my dog, of course. So these are exactly the kinds of things, yeah, sports, cooking, arts and crafts that you're like, do people really want to hear about this? Like, do they really care that like I have a dog and that I like to cook? They do. Like the stuff that you share doesn't have to be only like this big wow factor stuff. It's like, no, you know, we want you to send the message of like, I am a normal person. Um, I am I am a regular person. I do regular person things. And also I have this cool career where I work at NASA or I work at a TV station or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I also do other stuff that is in no way related to my work, right? Like I like scuba diving. I like to travel. I um, play guitar, you know, any, any of these things. It really sends the message that you can be more than one thing. You can do more than one thing, right? Because a lot of the time, the message that gets through to kids is, if I want to be a doctor, then that's what I have to be. I'm a doctor. I can't do anything else. And it's like, nope, you can still do other things. Like, what are the things that are important to you? Um, you know, I'm a mom. I love to canoe. I spend a lot of time outside. I like to do um, arts and crafts stuff. I like to do all these things. I also am a TV producer, right? Like I do a lot of different things and that all makes me a whole person. And honestly, it makes me better at my job because I do these other things. So um, don't be afraid to share these things, right? And show pictures of your kids, right? Someone is oh, Svet's, Svet's sharing about her kids. So um don't be afraid to share that stuff. And it can be a really fun, engaging way. Like even all of you right there, like no one was afraid. It didn't seem like to type in the chat uh, stuff they like to do. So it's a really great way to pull people in and make them feel connected when you say, oh, I really like to, you know, go see live music. What kinds of music do all of you listen to? What's your favorite band? Who is your favorite, you know, what's your favorite new album and things like that. Like, um, try to think of ways too, where you're like, here's something I really like. How do you all connect with that? What, what do you see in that? Okay. Um, so strategy number three is about sharing your STEM journey. And so this is, uh, we say journey because it really is a journey and everyone takes a different path and everyone's journey looks different. So, um, it's, it's really, powerful to talk about how you got where you are and to also think about how you are not at the end of your journey, right? You are somewhere in the middle of your STEM journey, even if you've been working in your field for a long time, right? Like thinking about what have I done in the past? What am I doing now? What could I do in the future, right? These are all journey pieces. Um, and um, this can be a really strong way for kids to think about the different paths they could take, right? And everybody's path looks different, right? Did you do high school and then college and then grad school and then something else? Or did you take a gap year? Did you fail out of college? Did you really struggle in some classes? Did you um, get a degree in something completely unrelated and then change your mind and end up someplace else? And it can just be... Um, really a really fun way to talk about how like everyone gets here in a different way and um it's okay to be be like be specific about what you did and talk about this I was here and I really loved this but this was really hard and so then I did this and like how choices you make along the way have brought you to where you are um 
And you can do things like start by thinking about what first inspired you, um, which is where I shared, you know, my mom had a telescope. She was not an astronomer. She was not a science person at all. She didn't go to college. And um, but she still was my inspiration for um, for choosing to go into uh, planetary science, which was um, what I was doing research on when I was in grad school. So that kind of thinking about what youth might have or what you might have been doing when you were the age of the youth that you're talking to um, can kind of be an interesting entryway also. Um, what are other things? So it's also when you're talking about your STEM journey, like think about things about your job that you really like um, and like ways that your career is um, personally and professionally rewarding. So that can be things like, I really like my, you know, my job because it allows me lots of time. I get lots of vacation, right? And that is an important thing for me because I'm a mom and I like to do things outside. It's important to me that I, that I have time and space to spend with my family. Um, and I don't have to, I don't have to choose between the two. So like, that's an important thing for me in my job. And it is part of my STEM journey, right? Um, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, so talk about choices you've made along the way. You can talk about what first inspired you. Describe how rewarding your job is. Um, and talk about what the future holds for your career. And I think especially if you're in um, astrobiology, this could be a really, really exciting talking point, um, you know, to not just talk about the thing that you're studying right now or what mission you're a part of or anything like that, but talk about like, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, this is what I hope our field is doing, or this is, this is what I hope we discover, or here's where I, a direction I hope we take, or here's something really exciting that might happen. Um, and I think we all love love to hear about that excitement for the future and um, kind of what possibilities are out there. Okay, pause. So I don't talk too fast. Okay. Um, so talking about your STEM journey also kind of naturally brings you to challenges and barriers, barriers you might have over overcome in your STEM journey. And we don't want you to be afraid to talk about things that were hard. Um, and so I want everybody to think for a second, like what's a barrier you had to overcome? What's a challenge you had? And maybe even what's a way that you could talk about this to other people where it's not necessarily like just you recalling a terrible thing that happened, right? Um, it could be a like, you know, I really struggled with math. And so that was that was a challenge for me, but I was able to work past it. I had to retake a class. I had a tutor. I had to put in a lot of extra time. And here I am, right? It was hard. Everything wasn't always easy, but I still made it. So think about um, a challenge that that you would share with a youth group um, to, to share about your STEM journey, or maybe, you know, maybe that's why I was talking about, like, I started out as an English major and I decided I wanted to this and, um, and I changed gears and it added a whole a year to my college career or something like that. But so go ahead, if you want to unmute or you can type in the chat. Um, and I know sometimes it feels weird to share stuff like this in this venue. So you don't have to if you don't want to. But I just want to point out that it can be really helpful. OK, I can't see the chat now. Nikki's laughing. It can be really helpful um, for your colleagues, like for everybody else here to see the types of challenges that someone else might have had. Oh, <laughs> someone was an English major. Um, I was never an English major. That was just a random thing that I am calling out. But. But yeah, I think part of why I want um, everyone to share is it can just be so helpful for everybody else on the call to see and be like, oh, right, I did that too. You know, I kind of have even forgotten that that was a challenge I had. Yeah, does anyone want to unmute and talk? You don't have to, but. I can do it um, so I can get the discussion going because I really want to hear from you all. But I will say that part of my journey was that, yes, I was one of those people who was bad in math as well as physics. And then I went into I pivoted into science communication because I was not I thought I was not good in science. And then I went back into science and astrobiology for my PhD. And so here I am. And that actually really affected what I do as, as a career right now, because I wear both a scientist hat, 50% of my role and doing the science communication guild, the other 50% of my role. So um, that's both science and psychom 
So that's why I am doing what I'm doing today. I can I add to that too? Um sure, please. Yeah, I would say that so I um every journey pivots, you know, and so yeah, you go on a vacation and it rains, you know, or I hated calculus and all that stuff. But um, so we're constantly making those changes all our lives, even when you retire. I'm doing it now, you know, so that there's not like this path and then you're on it and it's done. No, no, no. It's every single day of your life. And that's okay. And you can make it around science or get back to science or whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love so that, Margaret. Yeah. I was going to share really quick, too, and I won't try to talk too much. But, um, yeah, uh, I actually build this into my presentations quite often, um, my genesis and my origin story, which um, – I was kind of raised in what I consider a cult and young earth creationist. And so I kind of gauge my audience on how much I want to share about that background, depending on the age and what, you know, what they are, what they're talking about. But I definitely like to talk about that because um, it actually has given me the strength to be a really great science communicator now, um, because I know what it's like not to know anything. Like I was told dinosaurs were, were fake. So, you know what I mean? Like, um, so that, that is definitely something I kind of, I was told that they were, they were, and that NASA was lying, that NASA knows that they're lying and that they are trying to trick us. So, you know, having that, um, though really, I think helps bridge a, a barrier for me to connect with people when they're like, well, I don't know anything about science. I'm like, yeah, I didn't too. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that could be such a powerful story to tell, even if, um, you know, like you said, you have to gauge your audience, right? Cause you don't. You don't know if that's going to open up a whole can of worms that you don't want to get into. But even if it's like a short version of that, where you're like, I, you know, I grew up and that no one around me believed in science. And but here I am. Right. Like I didn't my parents weren't both scientists or like you don't you don't have to come from a science family to be a science person um, or anything like that. That's um, that's a really beautiful story to tell, I think. All right. Anyone else want to share? There's been comments. In. Yeah. I had one that sure. I, I was trying to think of ones that could also be like inspiring rather than maybe discouraging. But um, I, in college, I was also an athlete. I was on the swim team and I also got a minor in English. And I think like sharing that story of like, you can have other interests while pursuing STEM um, could be really cool just because, you know, it's more time to take on things. So yes, it makes it more challenging, but you know, I wouldn't have had it any other way. So. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I'm just trying to look at some of the other comments. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Yeah. I think, you know, kind of the general, um, the general idea that we see in the research about this is that like some, um, some people who are talking about their career, some role models might be really hesitant where they say, well, I don't want to say um, that it was really hard being the only girl getting a physics career because I don't want to, you know, discourage someone from doing that. But but it turns out it's actually kind of the opposite in that, you know, saying that you might encounter this hardship but it's okay and you can still do it and and you can work past it. And I worked past it or th things like that, like kind of giving that um, idea that like, it's not always going to be easy and you're going to run into bumps and it's going to be hard. And, you know, you might get upset and frustrated um, and, but it's up to you and it's your journey and you get to make that decision um, can, can just be really, really powerful. Oh, I like Savannah said, our backgrounds give us unique insights and abilities. I that's yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Now, I, now I'm distracted because I'm reading all the comments, but we're but so I think I just want to really empower all of you to to not be afraid to talk about things um, that were hard. Um, especially if you can do it in an inspiring way, right? Like I, you know, I failed a math class, but I redid it and I'm like, I'm still here. It doesn't, everything isn't always easy because I think a lot of the time that's what you see, especially on TV, right? There's kind of this um, perception that people that, that go into these big science careers or that work for NASA or things like that are kind of always a phenom in their field. And so showing people that like, you don't have to be the best at everything all the time um, 
and you still you still have an amazing contribution to make um to 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 the world okay Okay, so um, I'm going to share one um, one more strategy, and then I'm going to hand it over to Nikki. But before before I do that, I want to talk about another word. So um, we're going to talk about diversity, and I I just want to be very clear because I think sometimes we see the term diversity and we just think about race and ethnic race and ethnicity. And so I want us to all take a much broader approach to diversity and think about all of um, the different aspects that that kind of go into diversity. And so that's socioeconomic status, cultural background, lifestyle choices, experience, interests, right? So diversity is this very, very rich um, way of looking at how all of us connect and um, where we come from and that there are so many different um, things that tie into that, right? So I'm, I want you to just think beyond the color of someone's skin or someone's religion, diversity um, can mean um, a much bigger set of things um, that, that we're looking at. So I'm saying that before we jump into the next um, the next strategy, which is about showing the diversity of people that work in STEM. And this is so important, um, especially if we're trying to reach youth from diverse backgrounds, right? Um, from many cultures and um, many socioeconomic groups and many different lived experiences. And we want to just be, be really obvious about showcasing the amazing variety of people that work in these fields. Um, and the, re the reason we want to do that is because we want everyone to feel and see that this could be something for them. Okay. And if all they see is um, white men or white women, they might not feel like this is a place for them. And you can do this, you can showcase diversity in a lot of different ways. Um, if, you know, how you are talking about yourself and your pathway um, and what you do outside of work can be one way to kind of jump into this diversity piece. But you can also talk about the people you work with. Um, so the the photo that's up here, uh, I'm not in this one because I wasn't filming when we were at that episode, but um, this is the crew of our show, Psy Girls, and they're working with some girls there at um, Johnson Space Center in Houston. And let's see, there's Ellen Ochoa is, um, was one of the people that was on camera there. And um, it's an amazing kind of diverse group of people that, that worked on that episode. Um, the girls there were all speaking um, only in Spanish in that episode. And so the producers were Spanish speaking. And I'm just looking, the camera guy spoke a little bit of Spanish. Um, but but that's just one piece of the diversity, right, is, is the language that they were all comfortable speaking. Um, so that's one way you can do it is by talking about the, the people that you work with and how having a diverse group of people on your team brings so many different strengths to the work that you do, you know, and, and showing the power of diversity on any team um, and that that can be really important. Nikki's taking over control. Okay, so um, that's one way to showcase diversity, but there's a caution here that I have for you. And that's that, especially if you're um, showing pictures, make sure that you're only showing pictures that you are allowed to be showing, right? Like um, we have photo releases of all these people. So I know that we are allowed to share this photo, um, but we wanna make sure that you're not tokenizing anybody or just kind of calling out like, hey, we had this guy on the set because he spoke Spanish. Like that's not the only reason that Marco was the producer and director for this episode, right? Um, and in fact, he produced many episodes for us, not only Spanish spoken episodes. But so just be careful that you're not tokenizing anybody, um, that you're talking about their talents and what they what they bring to the table and not just talking about um, one particular aspect of their life. And also be really careful that you're not calling out anything about someone that they wouldn't publicly share with other people, right? So we don't want to um, out someone from the LGBTQ community if they are not comfortably out or um, anything like that, right? So anything else? 
about showing diversity. No. Okay. I'm going to hand it over to Nikki. All right. You muted? I'm getting there. Oh, I lost my, I lost my. I know. I also lost my ability to like, where's. Unmute. All right. Can everyone hear me? Are we, we good? Yep. Good. Go ahead. We're good. Are you moving? Sorry, that's me, but because okay. I'm trying to mute, I'm gonna can't mute myself. So okay. hopefully we're not echoey. Um, we're gonna move forward. Please let us know if there's any weird audio thing happening. Um, so number five, encouraging learning from setbacks. This one we've we've gone over a bunch. It's all about perseverance. Um, Katie talked about that a lot when she's talking about sharing your STEM journey and the challenges you may have faced. Um Oh, thank you, Svetlana. She said she was able to mute you. So, um, but so we won't like cover that one, that side of this strategy too much right now, because we kind of cover that in the, the journey. But think about it from the perspective of when you're actually working with the youth, if you're doing activities with them, if you're like trying out experiments, um, and how you're going to approach communicating with them to encourage learning from setbacks. So um, some things to think about is like to step away from saying, good answer or um, you're so smart, you're really quick at getting that. And think about it more along of the, asking them to look at it through a lens of how they got to where they are. So how, what is their journey to get to that answer? So things like, how did you get to that answer? How did you decide what to do next? Um, commenting how they work together with another um, classmate or, or, or another person in the program. Um, so thinking about their journeys and how they're going to do that and how they're going to persevere um, when they're in STEM. Um, and then also, if they ask you questions, it's okay to not know the answer um, and to show that it's okay to not know the answer. Um, so saying you don't know and like, let's look that up together. Let's figure out how we can find that answer together is um, another way to really encourage them to learn. All right. Uh, it's not changing for me. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Um, so strategy number six, communicate how your work impacts people, your community, and the world. Um, so we really want to look at our jobs in it from the positive lens here and how our work is impactful. Um, and it can be on the macro or micro scale, um, you, you know, in astrobiology. Let's stop and think about how that work impacts people, your community, and the world. Um in other careers, maybe it's, um, does your job improve safety? Are you, is your job give jobs to other people? Um, does it improve health outcomes or affordability? Um, just really looking at your job and really thinking about maybe it's just in your office space that you're in. How are you being impactful and positive to the people around you? Um, cause a lot of you, if they really want to know that that's what they're doing in their, in their work and in, in their, in their careers going forward. Share what you like about the day-to-day -day of your job. Um, so once again, thinking just when you go to the office, is there a colleague you like to work with? Is there free coffee? Is there, do you get to travel for your job? Um, you know, just thinking about those things. Um, do you have a good view out your window? Just even, it can be that small scale, but just trying to think about the really positive things um, that your job gives you. Um, and then also when you think about those colleagues you work with, um, think about how, share how, people who maybe aren't directly in this sort of STEM or this field that you're in um, and how you work with them and how they are a part of it and how they bring positive things to your job. Um, you know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, you, the, maybe you work, you work in science communication. I think it was Svetlana who shared that as well as doing this really direct STEM work. Um, but that's, there's other people who are doing that too. And how do you work together and how do you, um, how do they bring a positive aspect to your job? So we're going to take a moment to reflect now about how your careers make an impact on people or the world. So you can go ahead and share in the chat or unmute yourself. Anyone have any, anyone want to jump in and. I don't want to be the only one talking. <laughs> I want other people to have a chance. This um, is another one of those things that I think it's really helpful to hear from your colleague, colleagues, right? Like mm -hmm. if they also work in, you all work in astrobiology, I think, right? I say that with a question mark. So 
how would you talk to the public about how your job impacts people or the world? I think it's been covered a lot, um, but I really, uh, I really love sharing that I am a mom, and I'm actually a single mom. So um, I love sharing Being that curiosity of the masses. That's that's a great example. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Can you hear me? It can be a tough one if you you have to kind of step outside of your of what your your day to day is to think about it. I don't Sarah, know if you can hear me. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, can, I was Sarah, talking earlier. I, I, I was like, I don't want to be the only one unmuting and talking. I don't know if I have to no, uh, my mic. Sorry, I look like a hot mess because I was putting the bees in. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I, it came up earlier, but one of the things I really do like to also share too is that I am also a mom and a single mom. And I like last year at this time was sailing on a two month expedition and it was my, my village, my community that made that possible. And so, um, I love to share that not just with you, but you know, I'm always thinking about the parents that those kids are going to go back home to and, um, say like, Oh, I met this, this woman and, you know, she's got kids and she did, you know, she sailed on the ship and then it gets into that mom's ear, you know, in her head too. And like, wow, she was able to pull that off. You know, like to me, that's just like maybe a sneaky way of kind of like inspiring women too, but that's kind of Mm -hmm. one of my like ulterior motives. (laughs) Absolutely. Sorry for managing that audio. Uh, Yeah, just you're you're out there being a role model as a really impactful to people in the world. Um, Natalia, on the same path, um, and tell you the science outreach in a very marginalized area of Mexico City, which historically has not received much attention. And in her work, she manages to provide a bit of fun, knowledge, entertainment to these people. It's great. It's great. I think it's also worth noting that in the field of astrobiology, we're a little bit unique in that our science affects society so much. Like that, that specific question of are we alone in the universe? If we do find an answer to that, that has so many implications to so many different parts of society that, you know, maybe more challenging for some scientists to be able to relate to others in the same way that an astrobiologist can relate to, you know, most people who are genuinely curious about that question. I mean, if you do some, you know, some sort of technical work or research that it it isn't clear how, what the implications are to society. You know, mm-hmm. we as astrobiologists are lucky that our our work is so impactful. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think never underestimate the power of um exciting the public about new discoveries. Um and and that kind of level of excitement is actually very important for people um pursuing careers and research and things in um, in STEM fields in general. Great. All right. Thanks, Katie. Uh, so we'll move on to strategy number seven, show how STEM is creative and collaborative. Um, there's a lot of like misconceptions that you get a STEM job and you're just kind of by yourself. And that may be the case sometimes, but I think we all know in our in our careers that we are never fully by ourselves in what we do. So how do you, how does your job work with other people? How, what do you do? Who do you work with? Maybe even just once again, outside of your immediate role, um, other people in the organization that help communicate what you're doing, that help design um, the like pamphlets that are going to hand out about what you did, um, thinking about who you work with and how, and how your job is creative and collaborative. Um, this is a, a great way to um, introduce an activity when you're working with youth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about doing virtual and, and tips for working with youth. But um, we encourage you, whether it's virtual or not, to um, do one, bring an activity that relates to what you do when you're working with um, youth programming. Um, really hands-on. If you're virtual, make sure you're working with that educator um, at the actual location to that they have the materials that they'll need to do those activities with the youth. But um, but bring an activity, have them learn through at their their, their grade level um, what you do and, and something relatable. And then make sure you're assigning meaningful roles to everybody that we're not just having one person be like the tape dispenser, that everybody has a way to get their hands on this on this project and and work on it and um, feels like a part of it. Um, 
And then um, another area about this is um, encourage participation with open-ended questions. Um, once again, find out what the group knows about what you do already. And that can just, if you just throw out, what do you know about astrobiology? They might not know anything. Um, that's highly likely and that's okay, but just kind of have them start shooting out answers and see and guesses and and then go from there and work off of that and, and think about ways that maybe something they're saying might relate to what you actually do. Um, encourage youth to make predictions before jumping into activity. Um, don't save questions for the end, ask questions throughout. Saving time for comments. But... Yep. Um, and then finally, this is the last strategy, but non nonetheless important. Um, number eight is provide resources for support and guidance. Um, this is where you'll really want to work with the educator that is hosting the program. So the outreach program lead, whoever that may be that you're in communication with, um, about areas of opportunity in their communities um, for the youth. So um, talk to them about who they can talk to in their schools, if they're interested in um, going into any one of these careers, um, explain why their classes matter. Um, so even like, regardless of the field of study, why do these math, science, tech skills, um, English, uh, writing, anything like that, why do these things matter um, when they go into these careers? Okay. And then talk to the, edu the the program lead, the educator that you're working with about maybe there's after school programs or community ed programs that they can join um, and that, that you may not know about because you're not there, but um, can find out from them and give them those opportunities. Talk to them about non like non um, university career tracks that they could go on that are STEM related as well. Um, you know, we always need electricians and and um, mechanics and and things like that that are also very important STEM careers. And then just once again, plan ahead, um, talk to the educator, make sure you have all of your resources that you need. Um, if you're doing an activity, what is that going to look like? Um, what does the educator need to do that activity so they have all the materials in place? So before we move on, those were the eight strategies. Do we have any comments, questions? I think the next slide. Um, so if you have offered, if you have ideas for um, resources, STEM resources, we encourage you to share them here so that um, others may utilize them as well if they are not aware of them. Sorry. But also, if you have any questions or comments on the strategies, you can take a moment to answer those. Um, yeah, there's a question in the chat. Uh, do you have any strategy specifically to do all of this in areas with high crime rates, drugs, and stuff like that? Hmm, I'm trying to think about that. Um, well, I think, sorry. Um, if... Are, if, are you, is this a question about if you are asked to work in that area or is this um, how to work with the youth in that area? Yeah, like specific how to get both. Okay, so like how to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and Katie, feel free to unmute yourself. You're still muted. So I'm hearing you on, on Nikki's end. Yeah, as long as you can still hear me on Nikki, that's fine. Um, I mean, I think really any of these strategies all still hold true sorry like i'm hearing an echo now um in any of those areas and it's always about being sensitive right uh, to um the particular problems of an area um and letting the youth share what they're comfortable so like in you know in particular you might um in an area with lots of drug use, you might have kids talking about being how being a paramedic is like a really important STEM because it's a medical field. Um, and just being open to that and kind of the idea of helpers and like anyone can be a helper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret says, yes, focus on all the team members we need. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one is the one that that I have um, used a lot because there's a sense when you're teaching in a university type um, environment, you focus on that, you know, the real career paths, which are, you know, STEM. But, you know, none of us, uh, what would it take? So I play it as a role. What would it take to do firefighting in space? What would it take, you know, to have the food prepared? You want to eat, you know, trail mix for the next two years when you're going to Mars? So take it and make a funny thing out of it. Um, but recognize that those people are very talented in different ways. And they use science. I mean, the firefighters are using science and technology all the time, you know. And so I, I even ask them to think about how you put that in a term paper. You know, laminar flow of water versus non-laminar. Right? I mean, you can do, think about all the places, temperatures. Um, anyway, the yeah, water think, system in fire hydrants, you know. <laughs> and I, I I would I would say a lot of those um, uh, programs in areas like that really could use um some people like you all to come in and just and talk to them about these, the possibilities that are out there. And if that, I mean, you might have to push a little harder find, just to get in or just to find the pathway in. But I mean, I would, I would bet that they would love to hear from all of you if you were volunteering your time in that way, um, because they don't have the funding really to typically to have these sorts of possibilities come into their programs or their schools. Yeah, yeah, I, I was uh, also, um, regardless of who your audience is, it's always important to um, not only focus on like PhD level mm -hmm. accomplishments mm -hmm. and be respectful that that is not everybody's desire, right? Like even if that's where you are and then your job, you're surrounded by, um, you know, very academic people with with like high terminal degrees that that is not everybody's desire um and that's okay and it doesn't mean they're settling right we all have different goals in our life and and for a lot of people it's like they just can't they don't want to and can't spend that much time in school right they they need to have a fulfilling career faster and that is a valid um, path for someone. And I, I'm stressing that because I think it really is so important, right. To just be really respectful of everybody having a different goal as far as what their career is, right. Like they might not want to have a PhD. They, they maybe want to, uh, you know, what, what can I do while I'm in high school where I'm getting a technical degree in the high school so that at 18, I can have a job where I can help support my mom you know, and, or, or, um, you know, whatever that, that looks like, or I need to get out of, I need to get away from where I live right now. Like, what can I do now so that I can do that quickly? Um, so just think about all the different career paths that people might have. Sorry, I don't want to take over. No, that's okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> no, that's a I really, that's a really great question. And, um, thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, I was going to, I gonna, think um, we can move on to the next slide. So pull time. Um, think about your 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 work and think about going out to um, talk to youth um, in these programs and look at these strategies. Is there any in particular that jump out at you that you think will you'll have an ease of using in programs? And are there any that you might struggle with if you find you might struggle with sharing? Oh, Sarah says she's having a hard time mm. commuting. Yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well, I, I was just trying to time in, in the last slide of, of talking to the under, like, you know, underserved communities and, and those kind of communities, because that is a ton of my work right now is um, going to Title I schools and doing planetarium shows. And it's <clears throat> extremely um, impactful because like one school I went to, the teachers told me that going to Target on the weekend is like a vacation for these kids. Like that's, you know, as cool as it gets. So 
Um, I just was trying to share the fact that like whatever you can bring generally like supplemental material is usually kind of shocking to them. Um, I, I find these kids are just completely blown away. Anyway, that was the only point I wanted to, um, to make, uh, it's just that like most of the schools and, and I think I saw somebody say indigenous students too. There are so many um, restrictions on schools to be able to take kids to field trips, to go to places, to go to see things. So what you can bring to them is extremely impactful. And you just have to like be conscious of the fact that like it's going to be mind blowing for them. (laughs) And um, and you're going to have to deal with maybe some behaviors. But if you go in with that understanding, it's like the most rewarding thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I grew up in a very small town, um, went to a very small town schools um, and had really no like insight into I wouldn't have never have been told about astrobiology like that would not have that was not a career path that was shown to me back in that school. Um, So, yeah, I mean, just it's as you're saying, Sarah, that just just being there and showing that these things exist is is a huge deal. And I also um, commented about she uses strategies three to five um, and provides links. Yeah. 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 Well, we only have 27 minutes left. So I really want Katie to. um, So what we're going to do now. (laughs) So you may you maybe you're thinking like, okay, so I want to do this. What does that actually look like in practice? So I'm going to hand it back over to Katie and she's going to walk through her STEM journey and uh, how she would present it to um, a youth group. So go for it, Katie. Oh, wait, no. Oh, Katie, you're muted. Yeah, I don't know why I like lost control of the little button to mute and unmute me. Okay, thank you for unmuting me, whoever did that. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is um, these are actual slide my slides from when I um, do role model visits. So it's weird, right? And I just want to acknowledge that that like it feels weird, especially for me sitting in a room with Nikki, who's heard me give this presentation a million times now. But it might feel weird to walk into a room or to be virtually joining people and talking about yourself. But I'm just telling you to like move past the weirdness and just do it. And um, it it is very rewarding. And I think those of you who are doing work like this already know that. But like really, the more you're like talking about your personal life and who you are and showing pictures it um it really makes a difference okay so uh, i'm gonna jump in and pretend that i'm talking to a group of middle school kids so um hi thank you for having me my name is katie i use she her pronouns and i'm here today to talk about my job um but before i jump in i want to start just by asking you all what is your favorite show to watch on pbs because i work for a pbs station and i'm gonna um, talk about how i got here how did i become a tv producer um but what do you what do you like about pbs what's your favorite thing you've ever worked or watched on pbs it can be anything. It can be a kid's show. It can be a documentary. It could be a news channel or a, a news program. Go ahead. Type in the chat. What is your favorite thing on PBS? Interact with me. Okay. Ooh, Magic School Bus and Reading Rainbow. I love to hear that. We're actually working on a new show that is very reminiscent of Reading Rainbow. Um, Mr. Rogers, yes, Cosmos, of course. Everybody loves um Everybody loves Cosmos. So Cyber Chase, that's, I don't know that I've ever heard that one before. I mean, I know what Cyber Chase is, but that's not one that usually gets called out. Yeah, I mean, I think I, my kids um, are bilingual and they speak Spanish and English. And so I think some of their favorite shows to watch are some new kids shows that have bilingual characters like Rosie's Rules um, is one that my daughter in particular really likes um, because it's about a little girl who speaks Spanish and English. And um, that's what my daughter is like too. So, okay. So um, like I said, I work for a PBS station in Minnesota. My job there is I'm a science producer for a show called Sci Girls. And I'm also an executive producer for a newer 
horror show called Book Drop, um, which is about uh, reading books and it has scientists reading books. So it's kind of like Reading Rainbow. Someone mentioned that, but it's got animated characters in it and um, does lots of different stuff. So, um, but I'm going to talk to you about my job and kind of how I got here. And I um, uh, started my kind of educational career as a geophysicist and I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, but I've done a, a lot of different stuff. So um, I'm going to. No, it's not letting me advance slides. There we go. Okay. But first, I'm going to talk about who I am as a person. Um, so my name is Katie. Um, I'm a mom. I have two kids. Um, they're pictured up there in the upper right-hand corner. That's Henry and Hazel. That's kind of an old picture. Henry's in fourth grade. Hazel's in first grade. Um, or some of those pictures are old. Uh, the one in the middle is, I love this picture. This is me and my parents. And I have two brothers. And they're both married. And they each have two kids. So that's... Um, my kind of immediate family and all the little cousins. Um, this It's an old picture because my daughter was a baby. She's a first grader now. But um, I really love that picture because I spend a lot of time with these people. My family is really important to me. Um, all the little cousins in particular are together all the time. We spend a lot of time together. Um, I also have two cats. Um, their picture is up there. Their names are Stormy Star and Rainbow. My kids named them. They're pandemic kitties. We, we got them during the pandemic. Um, and we love them. They're part of our family. Um, so some of the things that I really like to do in my spare time, like in particular, I have a cabin. My family has a cabin in northern Wisconsin. Um, I live in Minnesota, so our cabin's in Wisconsin. It's like three hours away, and it's on a river, and we spend tons of time canoeing. So that's one of the pictures on the bottom there is me and my sister-in-law and um, one of my kids and two of her kids and then um, our niece, uh, my other brother's kids. So we we spend a lot of time with the kids in canoes and they're all actually very proficient in kayaks and canoes now. Um, my six year old in particular, she uh, she is amazing in a kayak and she she puts the rest of us to shame. I think when she's kayaking upriver, um, she's amazing. So so this is me, uh, my family. Um, one of the things that I really love about my job now is I have a lot of time off and I'm able to take big chunks of time away and go um, go up to the cabin, go up to the cabin, um, spend time with the cousins and, and things like that. OK, but I'm, I'm here um, to talk about my job. So I am a TV producer. You never see me in front of the camera. I'm always behind the camera. So behind the scenes. Um, one of the pictures here, let's see, I'm um, standing on the beach. This is when we were filming an episode of Psy Girls. We were actually studying um, manta rays and algae. There was a big algal bloom in Florida when we were there. So that's me and um, one of the one of our directors, Marie, and um, a camera and audio guy. And the other episode or the other picture there is um, kind of a recent a recent episode we did of Psy Girls um, that we filmed in North Carolina, I think. Um, and one of the things that was really cool about this episode is we we were funded by the National Science Foundation to um, do things in national parks where we were talking about citizen science. And so for this episode, we were actually studying fireflies. And I, what I what I really love about my job is that my um, one of the things that I do as a science producer is I am in charge of knowing about the science that is in an episode. And my background is in geophysics and geology, right? I studied um, earth and the moon really a lot. And I don't know anything about fireflies. And so what's really cool about my job is I just spent a whole bunch of time before we filmed this episode, learning everything I could about fireflies and also connecting with people who specialize in fireflies. So um, people who study insects for their career and know a lot about fireflies um, so that I could contact them whenever I had a question. And when I was like, is this right? Is, should we say this this way? And um, I really like that, that I'm constantly learning about new things. But my job as a science producer really is just to kind of know about what we're talking about and to know if the people talking about it on camera are saying it in an age appropriate way. Um, and so it's really fun. I'm just I just get to learn about lots of different science. And then when we're filming, I'm just kind of sitting there quietly with headphones on, usually listening to everything everyone is saying. Um, and and I really like it. And I get to work with a really amazing group of people that all bring all these different skills and perspectives to the table when they're um, when we're filming. And so like the the picture with the whole group of people up on standing on a porch um, before we went to go view fireflies, we were working with a park ranger 
whose first language is Spanish. And she um, did a lot of speaking in Spanish while we were on set there. And so we made sure that we had team members with us that also spoke Spanish. I only speak a little bit of Spanish, not enough to carry on a conversation about fireflies. Um, but our director for that episode, Marker, Marco, who's um, kind of in the back, he has like a white goatee. Um, he speaks fluent Spanish. And so he, um, it was really fun um, kind of getting um, getting to watch him play that role with um, with the park ranger that we were working with. Okay. So it's kind of a weird job. Like, how do you end up being a TV producer? I do not have a background in film. I didn't go to school thinking that I wanted to work in film or TV. Um, so I actually, I went to college at the University of Houston and, um, I, while I was there, I was working at Johnson Space Center and um, the Lunar and Planetary Institute and was doing, started doing research on impact craters um, under a, a professor that worked there. And um, that was really cool and kind of opened up a lot of doors for me to see that I could choose a field of study um, that really like interested me as a kid. I had always grown up um, loving nature and the outdoors. And that's kind of what brought me into geology. But my mom was always really interested in um, space and the stars. And she had a telescope and used to bring us out at night and we would look at the moon through the telescope. And so it was really cool that when I was in, in college, I kind of got to ch like take that interest and um, really dig in and do do a lot of research with a NASA scientist on impact craters on the moon was really what I was studying. And then um, I went to graduate school at the University of Alaska. So I moved to Alaska and I um, studied impact craters on the moon and Mars there and um, got to do a lot of really cool stuff while I was there. Uh, my thesis was on impact crater experiments that I did at the University of Tokyo. So I actually spent a bunch of time in Japan um, while I was in grad school. And that was really cool. And I also there's a picture of me here um, in a pink snowsuit um, because I was living in Alaska. And, and one of the kind of random Alaska things that I did was learn how to be an ice sculptor and became a competitive ice sculptor um, and did that for years while I was living in Alaska. And so that was kind of a fun thing that I was like, just the complete opposite of all of my scholarly work while I was in grad school, you know, I was researching and giving talks and like doing all this stuff. And then I would, you know, go outside with power tools and be um, carving an ice. So it was kind of fun um, just to get to do something different. So when I graduated or when I was finishing up graduate school, I kind of switched gears and decided, you know, I had been spending a lot of time in grad school volunteering at local schools and doing outreach events through the university. And one of my professors pulled me aside and said, you know, you seem to really like this, this education piece. Did you know that you can you can do that? Like this is a thing you can do for a job. And that just had never occurred to me. Um, and so I took a job at a museum and I worked at a museum in Alaska for years um, doing all different kinds of science outreach and science education stuff with kids. So there I am in the top um, looking at live animals from a touch tank of like marine tide pool animals. Um, and I also used to fly to, to rural villages and bring, I actually brought animals with me and reptiles. Someone else mentioned something about reptiles, but I used to fly usually with a baby alligator and a snake and a turtle. And I would go to all these tiny villages in Arctic Alaska um, where there are no reptiles. And so we were kind of teaching them about reptiles in a place where they had never seen a turtle or a snake or anything. Like that was really cool. Um, and then I also, um, when I was in Alaska, I kind of decided I wanted to move back to the lower 48. I was from Minnesota and um, ended up moving to Washington, D.C. And I worked for NASA for a while. I, um, I was at Goddard and um, I was part of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Education Team. So that's the photo that's down there is like an, an artist rendering of what the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter mission looks like or what the um, spacecraft looks like. Um that cost my time. Got to wrap it up. OK, so um, so I did that for two years and it was amazing. My job there was traveling around the country, talking to science teachers about the moon and kind of giving them all kinds of updated information about the moon and how to do um, really fun, engaging activities with youth about the moon. Um, and I was also working with the scientists and helping them kind of write public facing 
um, materials. But then I also taught physics at a university. I worked at a kids engineering museum. Um, and from there is where I kind of took all of these different things I had done, right? Like as a research scientist and as like a traveling science person um, in Alaska and then working at NASA. And um, when I was at NASA, I was writing scripts and things for um, NASA videos that were coming out of the, um, the scientific visualization studio. And that's kind of all of that came together to my current job where I'm writing curriculum and I'm helping um, train educators and I'm working on a show and writing scripts. So my job now is really like this culmination of all of the different skills that I've learned in, in all of my education and all of my different jobs. And um, I think it's really exciting what I get to do now because I think it's so important to make sure Okay, I think I gotta cut. I gotta cut myself off, right? Okay, so um, this is a part of how I would normally start um, an introduction to working with a youth group. So oh. I think I'll just stop there. What? I said you froze, but could you hear her? Just now. can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. 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 Um. So I'm going to stop there so that we have enough time to keep talking. But that's just kind of the general gist of my my intro. It was probably not the cleanest intro I've ever given, but um, I'm going to hand it over to Nikki now. OK. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, I can mute myself. No? no. So turn your volume up on your computer. OK. OK. All right. I think we got that figured out. Okay, so thank you, Katie, for sharing. Um, so let's take a moment. Let's revisit these strategies again. And what strategies did you see in Katie's introduction or her whole her presentation as a whole? You can add that in the chat or unmute yourself. Are there any of these that you heard her reference or saw her reference? Uh, Celia says, number four, share your STEM journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she talked about um, her mom inspired her. Um, making a personal connection, beginning with a question. Mm -hmm. Tying the your work now to your to PBS shows as that you that you currently like. That helps them get an idea of where she works. Mm -hmm. Are there any strategies that maybe you didn't hear her say that you think she could add? Everyone's so quiet now. We were <laughs> chatting before. That's we're over an hour into it. That's yeah. She definitely shared her whole self. <laughs> From the kids, the cats, canoeing, kids, cats, canoeing, ice sculptures. Yeah, this, uh, yes, the pictures showed collaborative environments. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But it didn't really provide resources for support and guidance. Um, there wasn't, I didn't really talk about learning from setbacks. I'm just pointing this out because like every strategy was not in there mm -hmm. and that's okay mm -hmm. that, you know, it doesn't always make sense. Um, mm -hmm. to have and every single thing. a lot of that might come up if you do like questions after as well, that uh, youth might ask you a question that might um, bring some of those things to mind as well. Um, we only have a few little, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, oh, Celia says, Number three, I guess you can never really know whether someone is giving you their whole self. It's true. <laughs> it's the whole self that you want to share. And we want, that's actually, that's a really good point because, um, and I think Katie stressed on this when she was talking about that strategy as well, is that um, 
really only share what you're comfortable with. You know, if you're not comfortable sharing certain things, then don't feel like you have to just to present this, this whole picture. Um, just please just share what you're comfortable with. And, um, and that might just change on the environment you're in as well. Um, but just know that that's okay. All right, let's move forward. Um, so this is all about working with youth. It's all about presenting your career to and your journey um, to youth. So what are some ways to do that? Go to the next slide. Um, so we've, we've touched on all these already, so I'll just kind of highlight them again, but um, asking those open-ended questions. Um, what do you notice about an activity, you're doing an activity with them? What does it remind you of? Um, give uh what what do you know about this career just um thinking about those open-ended questions and really let them do a lot of the talking in some cases um don't be afraid to say i don't know um we touched on that um help them look things up together starting with an icebreaker you'll notice we did that at the beginning of this presentation and katie did it again during her um presentation of her presentation <laughs> um so uh think of those icebreakers if you need um icebreaker ideas uh we've got them in this guide, I believe, and um, that can help you find those icebreaker ideas. Um, and always think about the um, the audience when you're thinking about icebreakers. Um, as Katie also mentioned earlier, um, not getting too personal, really kind of think broad, maybe just a what's your favorite animal is a good one. Um, just like that kind of broad general sort of icebreaker question, nothing that's going to really dive into their personal lives too much. And then also remember youth are people, treat them with respect and dignity. I mean, that's that's obvious, but um, just a reminder that, I mean, I know I, I even in my job that touches on um, youth programming, I don't have a lot of day-to-day -day interactions with youth. I mostly work with the educators um, that are working with the youth. So um, I know I can get a little kind of nervous and I'm also the youngest of um, 10. So I can get very like, I don't, I didn't have a lot of kid interaction growing up beyond just my friends. So um, really thinking uh, like I can get a little anxious or nervous when I work with kids. So um, I had to remind myself that just, just they're people. We just talked, we talked to kids. We talked to them like we talked to everyone else. Um, so a lot of you, if you're going to do these visits might be virtual and um, like we're doing here today. So, um, just things to keep in mind when you're doing virtual visits is to keep it interactive. It still can be very interactive doing those activities, working with the, the program lead of, of where the youth are, um, to make sure that you're all set up the same. Um, you can embed poll questions in these on Teams or Zoom, have all sorts of features now that are fun. Um, annotating tools on your slides can, can be fun to do. Um, don't forget to test your tech, um, making sure that maybe doing a pre-meeting with the um, program lead to make sure that all your audio is on and you can see each other. And keep in mind too, that when you're working with these um, the youth, that you want to be able to see them. That's just as important as them seeing you. So um, make sure you, that the camera that's on the youth, that you can see them all. You can So you can see a hand raised. You can see if they're paying attention or not um because you know they're kids they might start to drift and then you might have to like kind of recalibrate and think about how you want to approach things um but just keep in mind that you want to see them too and you want to be able to hear them too and and so that you can have that real interaction next one so this is the guide um the link uh, i believe spetlana put it in the chat earlier um it's on the screen now this is it and i have my blurred background on so you can't see it very well um but there are other um helpful tips throughout this guide including a um a page that you can just tear out and take with you if you're ever gonna, if you're doing any programs and on the back of that page um of the strategies is a sort of a my role, role model visit checklist and reflection. So as you're gearing up to go do these um, presentations, you can start to think about what your hobbies are, um, what inspired you, and you can write them down and just get your brain thinking in that way. And I'm rushing now because there's only five minutes left and I want to have time for questions. Um, so the floor is open. If you would like to ask Katie any questions or have any comments about what we talked about today.